with the first pick in the 2020 draft. Last year, the man selected to lead this franchise into the future came home. The Cincinnati Bengals select Joe Burrow, quarterback, LSU. Now the building begins around him to hopefully turn the Cincinnati Bengals into title contenders. On TV, we only get a few minutes to share each story, but here we get to tell you all the details about stories that are important to greater Cincinnati. I'm Stephen Albritton, and this is WLWT News 5 Beyond the Studio. Today on the pod, the NFL Draft is set for Thursday, April 29th, and the Bengals are lined up with eight picks to shore up the franchise in a season that saw their franchise quarterback go down with a devastating knee injury. Right now, Burrow, oh boy, clutching his left leg. Uh-oh. The Bengals could go many directions to outfit him with weapons or protection with the fifth overall pick. First up, Bengals.com senior writer Jeff Hobson. Uh, Jeff, let's just talk about team needs first of all. You know, we know the Bengals had that 4-11 and 1 record in the 2020 season. So this uh, what are the biggest glaring needs for the Bengals right now? Yeah, Steve, thanks for having me on by the way. I guess, you know, probably uh everybody's going to point to the offensive line probably as as one of the top needs. You know, they're looking for I think a third wide receiver. That would that would be nice. Probably looking to uh, shore up some linebacker depth. Um, but and they may, maybe maybe grab a young running back, maybe. But you know, if you're looking at honing in, I think they probably want to affirm up the depth on on both lines, offensive and defensive lines, probably. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about offensive line, obviously that's you know protecting the quarterback. We all remember the the Joe Burrow injury at the uh, what that the, the three quarter part of last season. The, what's been the mindset? from what you can tell us around the organization about making sure, you know, Joe Burrow is protected. He's, he's the franchise. And without a franchise quarterback, as we've seen in this league for years and years and years, it's really the cornerstone to having a winning, successful, stable franchise. Yeah. I think they've gone all out uh, actually to, uh, to, uh, you know, I think to address that. Uh, first of all, they brought in Frank Pollock, uh, a very respected offensive line coach that had been here uh, in 2018 and gave him the title of run game coordinator. So clearly they think one way of, atta- of, of keeping uh, Joe protected is with a better running game. Uh, um, they signed Riley Reef uh, in free agency, one of the top tackles, and immediately made him the right tackle, made the in and out there with Bobby Hart. I also think uh, doing what they did defensively helps Joe Burrow too uh, because, um, you know, if, if, if they can prevent the other team from scoring, that puts less pressure on him, obviously. So I think they've, you know, I think they've attacked it in a three, three-pronged way. Uh, the hiring of Pollock, giving him the run game coordinator job, um, beefing up on the defense, signing a veteran presence on the offensive line and reef that they haven't really had in a while. And then, of course, the fourth prong will be, will be the draft. Uh, when that happens, where it happens, not sure, but it will probably happen at some point. And with the Bengals picking fifth, you know, w- w- leading up to it, we've heard it could be quarterback with the first four picks, quarterback with the first three picks. So you could, you're, you could almost essentially argue that the draft will start with either Atlanta at four or the Bengals at five. You know, from what you've seen, from uh, the people you've talked to, uh, where where could the Bengals go here? We, we hear about Pitts. We hear, obviously, about Jamar Chase, a former teammate of Joe Burrow, then obviously the offensive tackle, which is a, a big need for the Bengals. I mean, you know, you just hit it on the head there. I, I, I think Atlanta, I think it's like Atlanta holds the first pick now and nobody really knows what they're going to do. Clearly the other three teams in front of them are going to go with the quarterback. What's Atlanta do? They could, they could, um, I don't see him picking a quarterback there. I do see him trading out. Um, and it depends who you talk to. Would they take Pitt, Pitts? Would they take Sewell? You know, they're probably not going to take the wide receiver. You know, with Julio, J- Julio Jones is leaving a pretty is leading a pretty experienced bunch there, but um, you know, Sewell Chase trade out quarterback. I mean, all sorts of things are going on, and um, I basically I think the Bengals probably have to go off of that. You know, whatever is whatever is going to be uh, left. Uh, I mean, you can make an argument for all three guys. Um, you know, that are at the top of the board. You can also make an argument for trading back. I, this is something that I've kind of broached. In the last couple of weeks, if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at a trade back, Bengals have done very well with uh, in recent years of late to mid first round picks. You know, you go all the way back to Jonathan Joseph in 06. Uh, 
you know, uh, um, to go in uh, the two tight ends, Gresham and Eifert, were at 21. Um, William Jackson, who's I think might be the top paid corner on the market, uh, Bengals drafted him with a 24th pick. So if you could, you know, if you could come out of the thing with three top 50 picks, if you made us, if you made the right deal, you know, who knows a lot of, you know, I mean, there could be a lot of interesting things there. Yeah. I, I hadn't even thought about that. Maybe you can move down to 10 or 11, pick up another early second Rashawn Slater out of sure. Northwestern offensive tackle might be there as well. So uh, in this off season, we've heard a lot about, I to talk about uh, um, quarterback control, quarterback input. You hear about Russell Wilson in Seattle wanting more say with uh, the roster. Is there any talk about Joe Burrow, you know, just at least having not, not so much a say in who gets picked, but at least having his voice heard in the room? Obviously, Jamar Chase, a teammate of his at LSU. Well, I would think that Joe's probably told him everything he knows about Chase, I would imagine, by now. Uh, you know, I don't know. You know, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not privy to what those conversations would be. I do know that uh, Zach Taylor and Joe have a great relationship. I mean, I think it's a, uh, those guys, you know, they've been talking ever since, you know, the end of LSU season, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, 14 months ago, uh, they were, uh, they, you know, they were on zoom. They probably feel like, I mean, they, they, they probably spent more time on zoom than any quarterback coach combat, you know, combination coming into this season between the draft season and getting ready for the year. So I, I think they've got a real good relationship, and I think Joe would uh, probably uh, is is a bright guy, and he's going to. Uh, if Zach has a question, I'm sure that Joe will answer it. Absolutely, and uh, just to kind of wrap things up, how important is this draft for maybe setting a cornerstone for the future? Because they went out and got their franchise quarterback with the first overall pick last year, Joe Burrow. Everybody knows that. Everybody loves Joe and is, um, seems to be rallying around him in this community. Um, but what will this draft mean moving forward for the Bengals franchise? Yeah, I, I think, Steve, it's uh, uh, they can build on um, a, two, two very good, I think, two very active and certainly expensive free agent classes. And – you know, they're coming off their most I, – I, this has got to be, certainly in this century, their most productive rookie class There's, uh, between Burrow and T. Higgins and Logan Wilson. I mean, uh, you know, these guys these guys had terrific rookie years. And I think that uh, you throw that mix you – know, you throw that in with uh, the 2019 class and 2018 class, this can kind of uh, – this can kind of be it, kind of set the, set the tone here be the bookend of that, uh, that 2017 group where Mixon was, was drafted. And which we've seen now is uh, this is where the leadership is. So you're looking, I think that 2020, the most, uh, like I said, the most probably productive rookie class they probably ever had. And you put another one on top of that with what they've already got. I think, like you said, the big thing was Burrow. And I think they've got uh I think they feel like they got the weapons around them, and now you just uh, you just kind of add it. You know, you're just adding. You you, you you know, if you draft as well as you did last year, you know, uh, and they proved they could draft pretty well high. I mean, you know, they got the first pick in every round. This time they get the fifth pick in every round. You know, they proved they could do that. So I I think it's uh, I'm kind of excited about it because I think uh, with what they've got in uh, free agency, and uh, with these last with the last with the next two rookie classes they're going to have. You know, last year in this one, there's going to be a lot of talent on the field. And hopefully get it to uh, translate to a few more W's than the four. And I guess you call it half of a win with that tie last year as well. So, uh, you know, when people get to that Thursday night and, you know, uh, Roger Goodell walks up there, opens up the draft, what would you tell the people of Cincinnati to expect? How would you tell them to, you know, feel when the uh, Bengals, uh, you know, come up on the clock? What should they expect? I tell you, they'll be very prepared. Because uh, they'll be able to, uh, you know, they've been meeting on this stuff for months, you know. So uh, whatever Atlanta does, it's probably, you know, they'll have the, they'll be ready to go with, uh, you know, probably responding off of that. I think, I think anything could happen, really. I would, I would, uh, and, you know, if you walked out of there with any of those, with either of those three players, any of those three players, I should say, Sewell, Chase, or Pitts, that's a hell of a draft, you know, I mean, with any of those three, but let's see what happens. Maybe the, maybe the golden goose comes in the form of a trade, you know, but I, you know, I would say just looking at what the draft mix is saying, 
those are three those are three pretty good prospects thursday april 29th that's when the draft gets going jeff hobson senior writer at bangles.com thank you so much for joining us on the beyond the studio podcast we appreciate it steve thanks for having me on enjoy the draft we're taking a quick break on the other side we hear how some of these top prospects are rated and look into the second round and who could hear their name called for the Bengals. We've all seen it. That check engine light in our car. Do I check it now? Check it later? Can I keep driving? That one light doesn't tell you what you need to know. And if you get your weather from a symbol on your phone, you're not getting the full story. WLWT Weather has the only certified most accurate forecast in Cincinnati. It's where you get the difference-making details. You'll know exactly what to expect and when, so you can plan your day. WLWT Weather, Cincinnati's certified most accurate forecast. Welcome back. Next up, Mike Renner from Cincinnati-based Pro Football Focus, the leader in analyzing every player and every play of every game to deliver player grades, stats, and rankings. Mike, tell us first off, what does Pro Football Focus do? So we are the leaders in football analytics, basically. We have more clients than anyone else in terms of we get people that buy our data. We sell data to all 32 NFL teams over, I want to say close to a hundred colleges at this point, uh, by, uh, basically our advanced stats and our advanced analytics to make better decisions, whether it's through personnel decisions, uh, game day play calling decisions, or, uh, basically, you know, advanced scouting purposes. So that's, That is what PFF does. And like I said, we really don't even have kind of close competitors at this point. We like are the the football analytics company and we're based here in Cincinnati. Yeah, well, that that has to feel good. So, you know, when we we talk about analytics, that's kind of one of those words that's popped into sports over the last five, maybe 10 years. So uh, take your favorite position and tell us what kind of analytics you would break down and give to a team or a college or whoever might be uh, uh, asking for that. Yeah, so that's like our biggest things. We have every play will record a bunch of different data points, whether they're subjective or more objective data points, but say like quarterback position rather than just, you know, completion percentage, we'll give you, uh, you know, how likely based off of, you know, the depth of the pass uh, was that likely to be completed. So completion percentage over expectation or uh, how well they perform under pressure or how quickly they get the ball out of their hands. We just have all this different stuff uh, that basically, however deep you want to dive in on a certain, my job being NFL prospects in the NFL draft, or a lot of obviously the teams we sell it to their own advanced scouting purposes for to self scout or to scout for play calling for other teams, you can go as deep as you want. And that's kind of uh, how, we think the future of the game's going and it's utilized more and more in it pretty much every step since you know we started this company or it started when I started in 2012, but it's been utilized in pretty much every NFL team more and more every single year uh, as we've grown, just using this data for just to make better decisions basically is the ultimate goal. Yeah, you, you, the point you made about, you know, how fast somebody might get the ball out of their hands and football being a game of, game of inches, you know, these milliseconds can really make the difference between a sack, a batted ball, a completed pass all the way on down. So it's so interesting what you guys do over at PFF. But uh, we, we're talking Bengals right now, coming off a 4-11-1 and 11 and one record, eight picks this year, the fifth overall pick right now. You know, you, you've bro- broken down who's available coming up, and we, we know quarterbacks are going to be the hot commodity, but the Bengals drafting Joe Burrow last year. Coming up at five, what is kind of the options if you were to be talking to somebody random on the street at five, what will be the Bengals options when come uh, draft night? So I think they'll be in luck. Like I, you can put pen in quarterbacks, one, two, three. And honestly, I think a quarterback's going to go four as well. I think either someone's going to trade up or the Falcons are going to take a quarterback. So they'll have the position player and that's best position player available, which for us. And I think for them, the decision will be either Florida's Cal Pitts, LSU's Jim, who's a tight end. LSU wide receiver, Jamar Chase, who obviously was Joe Burrow's number one wide receiver there back in 2019. And then Oregon offensive tackle, Penny Sewell, who everyone, you know, he had the banner up in Paul Brown here because obviously Joe Burrow got hurt because their offensive line wasn't good enough. So that's going to be their decision at number five overall. Obviously, trade down is also a decision. But I think if you're staring one of those kind of blue chip type of players in the face, 
you're going to be hard pressed to trade down unless it's one or two spots where you still know you're going to get one of those guys. So I think that's what their decision is going to be. Me personally, I've gone back and forth on it. I don't think you can go wrong if you're going to take one of those three. I think what will happen is it's going to be Jamar Chase because I think they're going to take input from Joe Burrow. And obviously Joe Burrow, I think, would want the guy who he's played with prior, his number one type of wide receiver, to try to appease him. And I don't blame – if that's your decision the process, if you're the Bengals, I don't blame him whatsoever. You see guys like Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson around the NFL unhappy because they're not being involved in that decision-making process, getting what they want offensively. And so whatever you can do to appease that guy when you get him, I think you go ahead and do that, especially when it's guys as good as Jamar Chase. It's not like you're splitting hairs there. But I probably would personally lean – Penny Sewell, just because he's that good at offensive tackle. It's a cornerstone building block. It's you just can't find guys like that anywhere else is the thing. You can go out and find wide receivers and free agency. Oftentimes you can't find offensive tackle talent free agency. You're going to have to draft those guys. So that's kind of where I'd lean. But again, like I guess I don't think they can go wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and I know there's one argument to be made, you know, as far as offensive linemen and rookie offensive linemen, they can really plug and play a lot better than somebody who plays on the outside where the game is going to be a whole lot faster versus NFL DBs. Granted, Jamar Chase played in the SEC. He's playing against elite talent, but there's still, uh, I would say, a bigger adjustment at a NFL wide receiver than would be for a, a tackle in the NFL. It's, it's like hitting. It's, I think it's changing a little bit nowadays with the way it used to be. You draft a wide receiver, you put them on the outside, and you're asking them to run, you know, one on one a lot more often. Nowadays, I think the. NFL offenses are looking more like college offenses in that they're giving guys room to work. They're not asking them to do necessarily uh, to win one-on-one as much as they used to. And I think you're seeing guys come in the league. I mean, Justin Jefferson just broke the rookie receiving record. You're seeing multiple guys come in and be able to at least produce somewhat year one. So like I said, any of those guys you do get, whether it's Cal Pitts at tight end, who the argument for him is, you're not going to find another tight end like Cal Pitts. There's, they, they don't exist, you know, in this draft, any draft, those guys are very rare, even though tight ends, not as valuable a position, maybe as wide receiver or offensive tackle. So that's the argument for him. But I think any of those guys you draft, they'll come in and make an impact right away. And, and even the year one impact, I think you're looking more when you have the number five overall pick, you should look a little bit more long-term. This guy's going to be the future of your franchise. So whatever, that's why I argue offensive tackle. Uh, but uh, any position really, I, I think, like I said, I don't think they can go wrong. If they draft one of those three though, that, that's if they draft one of those three, obviously you go wrong if you went elsewhere. <laughs> Yeah, if you, if they go elsewhere, I think a lot of questions will be lobbed at them when you have yeah. these three elite guys there. Um, so, okay, the Bengals pick at five. Their second round pick isn't until uh, 38, which would be, I think, the sixth pick of the second round. Say they pick Sewell at five. Who could they target because they need weapons on the outside? A.J. Green just left in free agency. Uh, what names could they hear um, in that second round if they were to go offensive lineman first round? What could they possibly have available um, when they get to the second round? Yeah, so that's things. No tight end. Like that after Cal Pitts, you're not drafting a tight end outside of that guy. Wide receiver, though, it's still a really deep wide receiver class. I think you could see, you know, like a T. Higgins esque type guy who come in year one and contribute at that point in the draft. The guys that would be, you know, fingers crossed, hoping for would be either Minnesota's Rashad Bateman, uh, who was electric as a sophomore, one of the highest grades in PFF as a true sophomore back in 2019, but then got COVID this last year, wasn't quite as effective. Um, I, so I think because of that may fall to the second round or LSU's Terrace Marshall. He's a guy who opted out midway through this past season, uh, but he was not even 21 years old yet. And tested out extremely well as pro day, ran the four threes. And another guy who has some length, to him. And I think that's what you want with Joe Burrows, guys who have big catch radius, because he that's what he prefers is guys that he can throw it up to them, even when they're not necessarily open. He trusts his guys more so than anyone. So I do think that Terrace Marshall, like or Rashad Baby, and both those guys have pretty big catch radii where they can they can haul in a bunch of off-target passes or just passes outside their frame that if you threw a small guy in there like Elijah Moore, I'm not sure he would bring that much value to the table for you. All right. So uh, Mike Renner with Pro Football Focus. We're breaking down the Bengals draft. Mike, thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond the Studio podcast. We will see what happen, happens come draft night. All eyes will be on that fifth pick here in Cincinnati to see uh, who the Bengals pick up for the future. For sure. Thanks for having me on, Stephen. 
The job kicks off Thursday, April 29th at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. This has been WLWT News 5 Beyond the Studio. I'm Stephen Albritton. Thanks for listening.